The 1920s were an important time in American history. Modern America was, in a way, born into the jazzy sounds of the Roaring Twenties. The culture born during this decade would dominate the rest of the 20th century, with radio and film, mediums we take for granted now, just beginning to take shape. It was the time when one of the most important music genres, jazz, was created and pioneered by gentlemen like Louis Armstrong and a certain dapper fellow named Edward Kennedy Ellington. His friends also simply called him Duke. Prohibition took booze off the streets and forced it into speakeasies, allowing gangsters to fight wars over liquor territory. But as important and as free and sometimes violent as the 1920s were, they were not an era commonly used as a setting in today's most popular interactive medium, video games. There are some exceptions, however, such as the one I'd like to talk about today. Laura Bow, The Colonel's Bequest, released by Sierra Online in 1989. Sierra is an important company, with company founder Roberta Williams being called the queen of the graphic adventure after her and her husband Ken created Mystery House in 1980. Adventure games prior had all been text-based, but Mystery House introduced graphics to that particular genre, and while very crude, it was the beginning of Sierra's lovable creations. In 1989, adventure games, especially those by Sierra, were games fueled with puzzle solving to advance the plot. Laura Bow was an attempt to shake up that formula, introducing a more character-driven narrative. Instead of solving puzzles to enter rooms or defeat a monster, the game wants you to take notes on characters' actions, their motives, item locations and purpose, etc. While there's still a few traditional puzzles to solve, the main crux of the game is the interaction between the characters. But how does that play out? Well, let's start at the beginning. Laura Bow is a student at Tulane University in 1925. She's studying journalism there. Her friend Lillian Prune, an attractive young flapper, invites Laura to her uncle Colonel Henry's estate for an apparent family reunion. Laura eventually agrees, and two days later the duo arrive at the creepy old estate in the middle of a swamp owned by the Spanish-American war hero Colonel Henry de Jean. At dinner that evening, the colonel, bound to his wheelchair from his old war wounds, tells his guests that when he passes, Everyone present will get an equal share of his millions. After the colonel retires, everyone started complaining about the old man. This disgusts Lillian and she and Laura retire to their room. This is where the game starts and we first gain control of Laura. Now fans of these types of games will be familiar enough with this interface, but for those of you not, here's a quick rundown. Laura can move with either the arrow keys or by clicking around the screen, but clicking will not allow you to interact with objects. No, that's more of a modern luxury you will need to actually type your commands. This is a pretty simple formula. You can look at objects, talk to people, ask them questions, or anything else you can think of, really. Laura is a journalism student and never goes anywhere without her handy-dandy notebook. This helps serve as a reminder for you, the player, to take notes during the game. And trust me, you're gonna need it. Time in Laura Bow is what forces the plot forward and advances it in 15 minute increments each time you enter a certain room during a certain time. Enter a room and see people arguing, time will probably advance. Then if you go to a different room and see something else happen, time will probably advance again. Of course, this means you only have a certain amount of time to observe certain things, or interact with other characters. You can easily miss them if you walk into what I like to call the trigger rooms at certain points. This can be pretty logic-defying, as you can almost advance an entire hour in seconds if you're in the right place. I started off by exploring the entire estate of the swamp, which is actually very expansive. Keep in mind this is an old game, but for only being able to display 16 colors, I think it looks pretty good. Everything for the most part is pretty easy to see, and the amount of objects you can interact with are actually surprisingly high. After meeting most of the characters and asking them about each other, it becomes pretty clear that they don't actually like each other. Lillian's mother's a drunk, Rudy's a gambler, and Clarence is kind of a prick. These characters are nasty, and questioning them on the others will help Laura understand them and what happens as the night goes on. Conversations between other characters are private most of the time, and the family members are not all that happy when Laura decides to come in and interrupt. But they have some interesting things to talk about. If only there was a way to eavesdrop. Well, there actually is. In the two floors of the estate, there are several hidden passages hidden behind cabinets, clocks, and mirrors. Moving these allow Laura to enter a secret hallway and peer into the rooms through peepholes and paintings. Doing so allows her to overhear the conversations going on in the room and hear information that helps expand the story as well as the characters' actions and motives. 
Spying into the right trigger rooms also advances time, but you can also enter the room and exit to spy on them too. The characters are pretty bitter, and these hidden conversations show just to what extent they dislike each other. Things are pretty hostile around this place. So far, there has been no real suspense during this game. That all changes around 8 o'clock when we decide to visit Gertrude, the Colonel's sister-in-law. Previously, we find her sleeping in her bed. Later, we come back and there's clearly something wrong. A knocked over table and an open window? That doesn't spell anything good. We can't see that far outside the window, so we go outside to confirm our fears. Gertie looks like she fell, or is actually possibly thrown from her room in the middle of the night. This is where I started to have problems with the text commands, or rather how specific I was allowed to be. I'm trying to tell Gloria about her mother's death. Her response seems a little out of place. I take out the word death and just say, tell Gloria about Gertie, and suddenly she goes and checks. But she comes back saying there's nothing there, accusing me of being a liar in a way. How was that possible? I went back out to check, and sure enough, Gertie's body is gone. Someone definitely killed her and moved the body then, because if she had just fallen, why go through the trouble of hiding and moving the body? Something is going on here, and it's making Laura's journalistic sense tingle. It really isn't hard to figure out what might be happening. The Colonel said that his estate would be split up equally to his family, and if anyone died before he, their share would be split with the others. So clearly, someone must have killed Gertie to make the pot just a little bit bigger. Later, Laura discovers Clarence, Gloria's boyfriend, and Wilbur, the colonel's doctor, speaking outside. They don't want Laura overhearing them, so they move rooms several times after Laura follows them. We get a chance to spy on them in the dining room, and it turns out they've stolen money from the colonel to invest in a racehorse that lost out big time. Most of the characters have a dirty little secret, including the colonel himself, who's been getting a little frisky with his maid Fifi, and isn't quite as disabled as we all thought. As time passes, characters leave certain rooms, and when the colonel is away, I snooped around his area, finding a key to his conveniently located elevator shaft. And after taking a bone from the kitchen and throwing it to distract a dog, I found a necklace. I also found an oil can and a crowbar in the carriage house on the island. The game doesn't have a ton of items, unlike other puzzle games by Sierra, but these are some of the important ones. Dr. Wilbur was reading in the library a while ago, but at a point we noticed his chair knocked over and a fire poker just laying around. What happened last time we found a room in disarray? We found a body outside, but Wilbur is nowhere to be found. When this happens, you will get no indication from the game on where to check or what to do next, and this is a prime example. After not really seeing much of anything going on, I decided to go back to the chapel on the island, just kind of on a whim. I was already there before, and lo and behold, there's Wilbur's body. Searching him allows Laura to take his monocle, which helps us examine different objects closely. This will come in handy, but poor Dr. Wilbur is dead and his share of the estate now goes to the rest of the family. And yes, his body disappears soon too. The necklace we found actually belongs to the Colonel's servant, who warms up to Laura and eventually lets us visit her shack and talk with her. She has some interesting thoughts on her friend Lillian, and we learn that Lillian's dad actually committed suicide, and that her mother Ethel cares more for the bottle than for her own daughter. Interesting. Spying in the colonel's room at one point allows Laura to overhear Lillian upset at the colonel because he says he cares no more or less for her than anyone else in the family, which leads her to believe that someone has gotten between Colonel Dijon and her, upsetting Lillian very much. We later find her inside a playhouse on the grounds of the estate, reading a book to a bunch of dolls. Okay, maybe Lillian isn't exactly the stable, level-headed girl we thought she was. Remember the secrets some of the characters have? Well, Fifi the maid and Jeeves the butler certainly have one. They're planning a nice little, um... We'll call it get-together later this evening that Fifi is getting ready for. She even took a decanter of cognac from the parlor room to help fuel their fun evening. Looking around in the bathroom, Laura finds a bottle of sleeping powder that we could read all the label previously, but now with Wilbur's monocle, we can tell that it's fatal in large doses. On a whim, I went back to Fifi's room only to find that Jeeves and Fifi had been killed as well, and they were drinking cognac before collapsing. They have no wounds on the body, and looking at the decanter shows a little white powder at the bottom. Someone really has it out for this family. Lillian really doesn't want to talk to Laura much at this point, but we can spy on her writing in her diary and hiding it in her suitcase. As the game goes on, more bodies start piling up, and a shadowy figure in a large hat starts stalking the estate. Gloria gets strangled. Clarence gets stabbed, 
and Ethelwood's killed and dumped in the garden. Lillian's diary says others in the family have to go, and we later find her back in the playhouse with a set of tally marks on the chalkboard. Her crazy talk, that diary entry, and the new tally marks seem to indicate something rather nefarious with our best friend. The suit of armor inside the manor can be oiled in various places with that oil can we found in the carriage house. I'm just going to oil the arm here and... Oh. Laura Bow wouldn't be a classic Sierra game if it weren't for some interesting deaths, and Laura Bow does have a few of them. These include the axe cutting you in half, falling down the elevator shaft or laundry chute, or even getting killed by the murderer in a closet. These deaths are easily avoidable once you get killed once, but they serve as a good reminder to save often. My favorite death scene is in the bathroom, where you can tell Laura to take a shower. After stripping down butt naked for us all to see, she starts her shower, and in this scene, right out of Psycho, she is cut down. This isn't much more than an easter egg, but it is really amusing. But back to that suit of armor. You can actually oil the mask of the armor to find a hidden handle. The handle works in the hedge garden statue to open up a secret tunnel. Just remember to light your lantern before going inside. The tunnel leads to a closed off section of the basement, where the laundry chute leads. As we creep closer, we find those missing bodies from before. A huge pile of them, actually. Gross. If you found the crank from a bell you can knock down earlier in the game, you can escape from the basement via tomb and find a pouch full of Civil War jewels. You don't need to do this, but they changed the ending just a little bit. There's a note on the door telling someone to meet them in the hedge garden, and that's where we find poor Lillian dead. She's dressed up in a weird outfit though, which actually belongs to the Colonel. It's possible she was the shadowy figure we observed outside in this weird getup. She also has one of the Colonel's guns and a bullet, so we'll take those. Returning to the mansion, there's the sound of fighting upstairs, and going up to the attic, we see Rudy and the Colonel fighting. We have two options. You can shoot the Colonel, or shoot Rudy. Earlier in the game, we saw Rudy searching Lillian's stuff, so it's possible he was also involved in the murders of everyone else. So I shot him down instead. The Colonel thanks us for saving his life, and explains that Lillian killed everyone because she thought they were getting between the Colonel and her. It really wasn't about the money, just the jealousy of only being cared about the same as everyone else. Rudy managed to save himself from Lillian, killing her, and decided to finish the job himself. He is arrested, and the Colonel leaves everything to his servant and lets Laura keep the jewels she found. And that's the end of the game. After the ending cutscene, we are given a rating on how well we did snooping around the house. I've never managed to quite get that super sleuth rating, which means you discovered everything in the game. The notebook allows us to review things and see what areas we were missing things from, so in the next playthrough you can go back and find them to raise your rating. Laura Bow, The Colonel's Bequest is a decent game. I think it's hard to play though more than once or twice because nothing actually changes in the game, so it becomes really predictable. Sometimes the bodies are in different places, but that's all I've ever noticed. And once you know when rooms will force the plot forward, you can play the game pretty much systematically since most of the items will always be available during any point in the game. It's not a bad game, and really nails the creepy mansion atmosphere. But with a terrible vacant scent of outdoor screens that really slow travel down to certain areas, and some cheap deaths that only help to encourage save scumming for new players, The Colonel's Bequest can be very off-putting to newcomers of the genre. Also, the time element really throws a wrench in the logic of the game. If someone was in a room at one point, such as Gertie, you can leave, come back, and she's tossed out of the window. The game isn't really counting on you to enter and re-enter rooms automatically, but if you do, you'll encounter such logic gaps. But hey, this is an early graphic adventure game, and it really is worth playing through. Laura Bow's inspiration comes from the actress Clara Bow, who rose to fame during the 1920s in silent films. Clara Bow was a symbol of sex during the Roaring Twenties, being called Hollywood's It Girl after starring in a silent film of a similar name. Laura would later become more of a polite southern belle in her second and final game, The Dagger of Amon-Ra, further stretching the difference between her real-life inspiration and her actual character design. The Colonel's Bequest is not as important to the industry as King's Quest may have been, but for those looking for a different type of graphic adventure game that offers a mystery to solve and a creepy atmosphere, then this is the game for you. If you're looking for the more traditional game, well, Roberta Williams and her husband have several on offer for you to choose from. 
Thanks for watching.